Side 9 The Yanks became frequent visitors at the Forces Club in the next months, along with many other nationalities of servicemen, as well as the British. It was a place where any of them could drop in for recreation, with darts and billiards and board games on offer, and the inevitable cups of tea or coffee. The club was open every day until midnight, with the staff working on a shift system. They now had a license to serve alcohol in the A Cornish Maid Side 9 The Yanks became frequent visitors at the Forces Club in the next months, along with many other nationalities of servicemen, as well as the British. It was a place where any of them could drop in for recreation, with darts and billiards and board games on offer, and the inevitable cups of tea or coffee. The club was open every day until midnight, with the staff working on a shift system. They now had a license to serve alcohol in the evenings, and since the local girls were often in short supply at the monthly dances, it was inevitable that fights would break out between the men from time to time. It rarely got out of hand, and nobody seemed to mind the scuffles, since it all added to the excitement of the evenings, especially if it blotted out the uglier sounds of gunfire and bombing further along the coast. It was only when the air raids were local ones that most of them scattered to the hastily erected shelter behind the club. The rest stayed where they were, defiantly ignoring any bombardment. It had become a policy of the club that all the staff remained at their posts until the last person was out, and since that rarely happened, none of them ever left. You gals should be given medals after the war one of the G.I.s commented after one blisteringly loud Saturday night air raid. It's not only the guys at the front line who are heroes in this war. We don't do anything, Amber said, trying not to reveal how her hands were shaking as she gave him his change. He caught her hand in his for a second. We've met before, haven't we? he said. I thought I recognised you, although my unit has been away for a while and I've only just got back to camp here. Amber removed her hand from his and looked at him properly. This was the way the Yanks operated, worldly Jenny had told her, warning her to be careful. But there was something familiar about the young man in the smart uniform, his dark hair falling over his forehead, his brown eyes smiling. I don't think so, she began. It was by the waterfront. A shower of rain had just started and... You looked good and mad about something when you nearly bumped into my buddies and me. Amber gave a small shrug. Well, being good and mad, as you put it, is nothing new to me, as anyone around here will tell you. But I remember that day now. It was Will who spoke to me. But you're not Will, are you? He gave a solemn salute which made her giggle. No, ma'am. Lieutenant Gary Emerson of the United States Marines at your service. She giggled again, remembering clearly now the three Yanks near the craft shop on that day when she had stormed out of it. Will had been the spokesman, and the other two had been a bit shadowy behind him. Someone called Chuck and Gary. She had hardly noticed them at the time. Well, I'm Amber, but you already know that. If he hadn't remembered it from that day, her name badge on her overall would have told him who she was. A beautiful name for a beautiful young lady, if I may say so. She was suddenly nervous. She shouldn't be, because this was the usual chat-up line, as Jenny called it. They often heard something similar, and not only from the Yanks. It seemed there was a universal language in chat-up lines. Where are your, uh, buddies tonight? she asked, to cover her confusion. His face changed. One minute it had been cheerful and smiling, and the next it was as though a veil had come down over it. Will bought it a couple of weeks ago, 
and Chuck's still in hospital in some godforsaken place in Wales with an unpronounceable name that must have a million letters in it. What do you mean? Will bought it, Amber said. In her heart she knew, of course she did, but some devil inside her made her want him to spell it out. Killed. Kaput. Is that plain enough for you, Missy? Or do you want to know the gory details? No, of course not. I'm sorry, Gary. I didn't mean to be insensitive. His face softened again. I'm sure you didn't. But I'd rather not talk about it. I came here to be cheered up. So, what time do you finish tonight? He went on. It's my late shift, so not until midnight. It's nearly that now. So, can I see you home? The all clear's long gone now. But it's still a nervous time for you guys and gals, and I have transport outside. Transport? Amber said faintly. Sure. And I promise you'll be quite safe. I've got a young sister about your age, and I always used to watch out for her if she was out at night. I'm pretty harmless. You could ask any of my buddies. His face twisted again, remembering. Amber didn't know whether to be put out by the implication that she was like his young sister who needed to be escorted home at night, but she felt a rush of sympathy since it was obvious that the memory of his two buddies was still raw. Before she could think of a reply, her attention was caught by the ripple of agitated conversation in the room and Jenny came rushing over to report. We just heard some news, Kit. The old Lanigan Hotel had a direct hit in the raid. It's been completely destroyed, went down like a pack of carts, apparently, and everybody inside it was killed, guests and staff, the whole lot. They say it's a hell of a mess, with rubble and bodies. Shock raced through Amber, as sharp as a knife. It can't be the Lanigan. Two of the girls from my class at school weren't there. She could picture them easily. They hadn't been part of her gang, but she knew them, had known them. She was breathing heavily, finding it hard to resist the urge to vomit at the thought of all that was left of the Lanigan Hotel. Jenny squeezed her shoulder. Well, they don't anymore. I'm sorry, kid. I didn't know or I wouldn't have blurted it out like that. Look, this has been a shock to you, so why don't you go on home? I'll take her, said Gary Emerson. Out in the fresh air, the urge to vomit became worse, and if she wasn't careful, Amber knew she was going to disgrace herself forever in front of this considerate G.I. who was helping her into some kind of army vehicle now. Take long, deep breaths, honey, he advised, and then give me directions. The sooner you get home and into bed, the better. Believe me, I know what you're going through. He was being so kind and gentle with her, after a minute or two, she managed to whisper directions to the cottage. When they got there, he helped her out of the vehicle and kept a grip on her arm until they reached the front door. Do you have a key? he asked. She looked at him stupidly. I don't need a key. I just opened the door. Sorry, I'm from New York, he said, as if that explained everything. He opened the door, closing it quickly behind them both to prevent the parlour light showing outside. Granny Penn was waiting up for Amber as she always did. One look at her granddaughter's ashen face and that of the young man who was clutching her so tightly told her that something was very wrong. What's happened? she said, her knitting falling to the floor as she stood up and came quickly across to the two of them. She's had a bad shock, ma'am, Gary said. Some hotel got destroyed in the air raid, and as far as I can tell, two of Amber's friends worked there. The Lanigan, Amber whispered. It was the Lanigan, Gran. She couldn't say any more as her stomach erupted, and she rushed through the cottage to heave over the kitchen sink. She was hot with humiliation at showing herself up like that, but a few minutes later she was thankful to find that the arms that were holding her didn't belong to Gary Emerson, but her gran. Let it all out, my dear, Granny Penn said, as Amber began to weep. Tis only the two of us here now, so there's no need to be embarrassed. 
the young chap's gone, but he says he hopes to see you at church tomorrow morning. Right then, Amber's horrified thoughts didn't include a stranger who had shown her such kindness, even while he too was grieving. All she could think about were two girls, aged 16, who had been in her class at school, who she had known since they were all old enough to hold a pencil, and who had been as bubbly and full of life as her a few hours ago. Now they were dead. The wickedness of it all was almost too much to bear. Amber didn't want to go to church on Sunday. She hadn't slept for thinking about the two girls she had known for so long, and she knew that talk of the bombing of the Lanigan Hotel would be on everyone's lips. But Granny Penn insisted. How will it look if everyone stays away? Of course people are upset, but at times like this, people should be together, if only to show Hitler that we can still carry on our ordinary lives, no matter what he throws at us. And how is he going to know that? Or care? It wasn't your friends who were blown to bits. So who's next, I wonder? She shuddered knowing that Gillam's boatyard was much nearer the docks than they were at the cottage. Luke would probably have been in as much danger of being blown up if he stayed at home as he was somewhere at sea. Now, you just listen to me, Amber, Granny Penn said. People can get killed running across a road. They can drop dead from heart attacks the way poor old Mr Veal did. There's no discrimination when it comes to dying, war or no war. And when your number's up, it's up. Well, that's fine coming from you. How come you didn't see it all coming in the tea leaves then? How come you can't tell us which bit of Falmouth is going to be hit next so we can all pack our bags and go away until it's all over? She was in the mood for an argument simply because she didn't know what else to do. Granny Penn sighed. I'll overlook that bit of nonsense. But just remember the nice young man who brought you home last night and his two friends that you told me about. I'm sure he's upset as well, but he's getting on with things because he has to. And didn't he say he might be at church this morning? She could be about as subtle as a barrage balloon when she tried, thought Amber, as if the thought of seeing Gary Emerson at church was going to stop the jitters that kept rushing through her with nerve-shaking regularity. But she knew she was never going to win this argument short of shutting herself in her bedroom. And how childish would that be? There were several small groups of GIs at church that day. The sermon was based on forgiveness and hope. It was necessarily more emotional than usual, as the vicar stressed that everyone should say a prayer for those who had lost their lives in the tragedy of the Lanigan Hotel, causing more than one woman in the congregation to be sniffing into her handkerchief. It was a great relief when they could all spill outside into the fresh air of a warm spring morning. There's your new friend, said Granny Penn. Amber looked back to the church door where the G.I.s were shaking hands with the vicar. Gary was among them and she saw the vicar give his hand an extra squeeze and murmur something to him. She felt suddenly ashamed of her earlier outburst that morning. The church had been especially full today, as if to underline her grand's words that ordinary lives still carried on despite all. When Gary turned away from the vicar, he caught sight of her. He smiled at once and came striding across the gravel. Morning, ma'am, he greeted Granny Penn. It's good to see you again on this fine morning, and I hope you're feeling better now, Amber. I am, thank you, she said. She supposed she was, more or less. The hymn singing had been no less lusty than it ever was, and the vicar's final words had been uplifting, as always. She didn't know what else to say to him. They were strangers, and they were standing here like idiots now until Gary cleared his throat. Well, I guess I'd better go and join my buddies. We're off tomorrow morning, so I won't be seeing you at the Forces Club for a few weeks, Amber. I hear there's some lovely country around here, but I haven't had the chance to see much of it yet. I've even heard tell of some place called the Lizard. So, 
When I get back, I wondered if you'd care to come out for a drive with me one afternoon. That is, with your approval, ma'am, he added to Granny Penn. I'd like that very much, Amber said, before her gran could say a word. It's a date, then, Gary said, and he shook both the hands before moving off to join his companions. Well, you jumped in there pretty quickly, miss, Granny Penn commented. What if I'd objected? Amber was defiant. You wouldn't, though, would you? You'd have thought of it as an omen, like I did. If I promise to go for a drive with him when he comes back, then he'll be sure to come back, won't he? And you're a bit of a devious little witch in disguise, aren't you? But her gran was smiling, and she knew she'd got the better of her. And it wasn't just for that reason that she'd accepted the invitation. She liked Gary Emerson. And what would be so wrong in going out with a well-behaved G.I. with transport on a sunny afternoon? Two other people were approaching them now, and Amber's heart shifted uncomfortably as she saw the disapproving expression on Luke's mother's face. It implied that Amber hadn't wasted much time in forgetting Luke and getting friendly with the G.I., she lifted her chin. She'd done nothing wrong, and Luke had spelled it out loud and clear that he didn't want her brooding over him while he was doing his bit in the Navy. So she had every right to make other friends. That was a terrible business at the Lanigan last night, Mrs. Gillam was saying to Granny Penn once they had greeted each other. I gather there were only a few guests, but there was no hope for anybody inside. Two girls from my class at school work there, Amber said jerkily, feeling she had to make Mrs. Gillam look at her, which it seemed she was avoiding now. Or maybe she was imagining it and was just being oversensitive. That's very sad, Mrs. Gillam said now, her expression changing to one of sympathy. We always expect our old friends to be there forever, don't we? Was that a dig about her and Luke as well? Amber felt her palms grow damp inside her cotton gloves. But then Mrs. Gillam leaned over and kissed her cheek. I'm afraid we have to accept whatever comes our way in wartime, Amber dear. At least it was a blessing that none of those people in the hotel could have known what was happening. They say it was a direct hit and that nobody could have survived for a moment. Amber nodded, fighting down the urge to cry. She didn't intend to burst into tears here, when there were people all around them, sharing their own versions of the terrible events of the night before. She felt stifled by it all, and thought longingly of a drive in the country at some future date, where the war and all its atrocities could be forgotten for a few hours. She gulped down the lump in her throat, and said huskily to Granny Penn that she really would like to get home now. You know, my dear, Granny Penn said once they were out of the vicinity. I think the very best thing you could have done is to accept that kind invitation from Gary. It will give you something to look forward to. Summer can't be far away, and Cornwall is never lovelier than in the summer months, especially when you are looking at it through a stranger's eyes. In other words... She had her grand's blessing, Amber thought, with an odd little catch in her throat. And more than that, she had a new friend, even if she wasn't going to see him for a few weeks. And the last thing she was going to do was to speculate where he and his unit might be sent to during that time. The local newspaper announced that the disaster at the Lanigan Hotel in Falmouth was probably no more than a rogue bombing as a German plane dropped the remainder of its bombs to lighten its load before turning for home. The fact did nothing to help the relatives of those who had been killed, and there was a succession of sad funerals in the next couple of weeks. Then, in late April, Winston Churchill decreed that church bells could be rung again for services or weddings. Until now, they had been silenced for the duration and would only have been rung as a warning of invasion. Now the government had decided that such a threat was over, 
It was an announcement that lifted people's spirits and made them think that surely the war must be coming to an end soon. Dolly's latest letter to Amber didn't uphold that idea as she wrote excitedly about an horrific accident in a daylight air raid near a tube station in London. What do you think of this for rotten, bleeding luck, Amber? She wrote. A woman carrying her baby tripped and fell down a flight of steps just as she got inside the entrance. An elderly man fell on top of her. No, not like that. And there were crowds of people rushing to get down the shelter as well and nobody could see what was happening. So they all fell on top of one another like a pack of cards and they crushed one another to death. They said there were nearly 200 people dead. And here's a turn up at the end of it. The woman survived it all, but her baby died. Makes you think, don't it? Is it safer down the tube or under the stairs? Which is what mum and me do most of the time when we can't be bothered to leave the house. It's too bleeding smelly down the tube anyway. After a night of it, you're glad to breathe fresh air, even smoky old London air. I suppose it's all quiet down in the sticks now. Don't forget to tell me about the Yanks you've got there. John Joe brought mum and me some nylon stockings the other week, but being mum, she put her fork straight through one of them and it laddered from top to bottom. I told her to wear it so it looked like a seam at the back anyway. Then she wouldn't have to draw it with a black eyebrow pencil. And don't ask what she was doing with a fork on her stockings. Amber had felt shocked at reading the awful first part of Dolly's letter, but she was laughing at the end of it. She felt obliged to tell her about the Lanigan Hotel and the two girls they had both known. But she also told her about Gary and that they were going on a date as soon as he came back from whatever manoeuvres he was on now. She deliberately didn't mention Luke at all. There was nothing to say about him anyway, and she knew it was daft, but it made her feel like holding her head up high at being able to tell Dolly that she wasn't the only one who knew a yank and had a date. By the middle of May, the horror of the Lanigan Hotel had faded a little, except in the minds of those who were most closely affected by it. Amber had accepted that her grand's words about sailors being away for long stretches of time had been right, because she hadn't heard from Luke for ages, and she knew he hadn't had any leave, or he would surely have been to church with his parents, even if he hadn't contacted her. She still thought about him, but not nearly as much as when he first went away. It made her feel guilty, because she didn't want her feelings for him to fade. She wanted to keep them burning as brightly as they had ever done. But it wasn't easy to do when it seemed as if they weren't reciprocated. You'll wear that door out if you don't stop looking at it, Jenny remarked one evening at the Forces Club. He won't come back until he's good and ready, kid. Or rather, until Jerry sees to it that he does. I know, Amber said, her head still full of Luke at that moment. Or maybe I spoke too soon, Jenny added. That looks like your chap in the middle of that crowd coming in now. Amber's heart soared so much it felt ready to burst. Luke, she breathed. And just as instantly she knew it wouldn't be Luke, because Jenny had never met him, and she couldn't think that Luke would come to see her here at work instead of being somewhere on their own. In any case... The tall figure separating himself from the others now wasn't wearing navy blue. He reached the counter where Amber was still experiencing a searing case of disappointment and leaned across it to grasp both her hands in his. You sure are a sight for sore eyes, honey, especially after some of those I've seen recently. Give me a beer, will you? I don't care if it's warm like you limey seem to prefer. It'll still taste good to me. You're back then, she stammered to Gary Emerson. What were you supposed to say next? Did you have a good time? Hardly. How did it go? You didn't know where he had been or what he had been doing. And you could hardly say you hoped everybody got back all right, because you knew very well that sometimes some of them didn't. At her words, 
Gary pretended to look himself over. I guess I am, unless I'm a cardboard cutout of myself, or one of those stunt doubles they have in the movies. I told you I'd be back, didn't I? We have a date. So, how about next Saturday afternoon? You don't have to bring anything except your lovely self. And now I know where you live, I'll pick you up and you can direct me to this lizard place. Whatever it is. She had to admit he was like a breath of fresh air. He breezed into the room and spoke so confidently, clearly never expecting a negative answer. And she didn't intend saying no anyway. All right, she said, her voice slightly breathless. But don't expect to see monsters or dinosaurs, will you? It's only the name of the area. What a shame. I quite fancied rescuing a lovely lady in distress from a dinosaur. And when we get there, you can tell me all about Cornwall. It seems quite a cute little place. Amber laughed, refusing to be affronted by his remark that Cornwall was a cute little place. She supposed it was, compared with a huge map of America that she remembered from her school days. She was also aware that she was feeling better by the minute. It was like her gran always said, Life had to go on, and you had to go on with it. The fact that Luke wasn't here right now didn't mean that she had to spend her days like a nun. In any case, Luke had made his opinions pretty plain the last time she had seen him. She forced herself to stop thinking about him, or comparing him with this fresh-faced G.I. who was making no secret of his interest. I'll tell you about Cornwall if you'll tell me about New York, she said. It's a deal, but I can't stay much longer tonight, as I've got to get back to camp to make a report. I just wanted to check with you about Saturday. He drained his beer, and she watched him weave his way in and out of the intake of servicemen that evening. When he reached the door, he turned and waved. Jenny was hovering behind her by now. I see you've made a conquest, Amber. You better mind what you get up to on Saturday. Were you listening? Jenny grinned. Just being envious, more like. He's a smasher. Just make sure you hold on to your principles, if you know what I mean she added with a wink. And if you can't be good, be careful. Amber felt her face go red. She wasn't naive, and she'd heard enough raucous banter among the men who came in here for a change of scene and a bit of harmless flirtation to know what Jenny was talking about. She knew that some of the girls had gone out with the G.I.s already and were full of the good times they had and how generous they were. Some even hinted about how far they had gone with their yanks, or how far they were prepared to go. The other girls were all older than she was, and for the first time she felt nervous, wondering if Gary realised she was only sixteen. She was tall and well-rounded now, and she usually wore her long hair twisted up on her head for work in the canteen, which made her look older than she was. She hoped Gary wasn't going to get the wrong idea about this date. For some reason, she found herself picturing how Dolly would react to being invited out on a date with a handsome G.I. Dolly wouldn't turn a hair, nor think twice, and there was no way that Amber was going to let Dolly get the better of her. She was going to enjoy it, and the nearer it got to Saturday, the keener she became. When the day arrived, she had let her hair down. She had plaited it overnight in the hope that it might retain a few kinks by morning but by the afternoon it hung down past her shoulders as straight and glossy as ever. She wore a pretty yellow and white frock and white sandals and the white crochet gloves that her gran had made her. The day was warm and sunny and calm, a perfect day for a drive in the country, the sort of day when it was easy to forget that there was a war on at all. You look a picture, Amber, Granny Penn said, when she came downstairs to wait for Gary. Just take care, won't you? In case Granny Penn was about to give her a few words of advice over how to behave with a young man, advice which was sure to make her squirm with embarrassment, Amber spoke quickly. It's all right, Gran. I've had all the pep talks from Jenny at the club. 
and I won't let you down. Well, I'm not sure Jenny at the club is the right person to do a parent's or a grandparent's job, Granny Penn said dryly. But I know you've been brought up to know what's right and what's wrong, my dear. Trust me to remember it then, Amber said, and turned in relief as she heard the toot of a horn outside the cottage gate. Before Gary came inside and had to listen to her grand's unsubtle warnings of how to treat a girl, she saved her embarrassment by kissing her quickly and ran outside to the waiting jeep. Gee, you look fantastic today, Gary said. Quite the little movie star. Have you ever thought about trying to get into pictures? Amber burst out laughing, her brief nervousness disappearing at such an absurd question. What a thought. I can't imagine myself on the silver screen. My friend Dolly's more inclined to want fame and fortune than I am. She's friendly with a G.I. who lives in Ohio. Is that anywhere near Hollywood? It was Gary who hooted with laughter now as he started up the jeep and followed Amber's directions to drive westwards away from Falmouth and out towards the Lizard Peninsula. Petrol was obviously no problem when you were a G.I., Amber thought fleetingly. I should say not. Ohio's about as far as you can get from Hollywood, barring New York and the eastern seaboard. What's that? When it's at home? she asked, mystified. He glanced at her, seeing how the small breeze ruffled her glorious hair, and how her blue eyes were shining with excitement, and thought he had never seen anything so lovely. He was a long way from home, and he had just spent an uncomfortable and unexpectedly dangerous few weeks on manoeuvres, and all he wanted was to spend these summer hours with a pretty girl. I'll tell you all about it later. We'll compare our lives and get to know one another, and we won't mention the W word. Is it a deal? She twigged right away and nodded fervently. Who wanted to spend this lovely day discussing the war? She concentrated on giving him directions. She hadn't been to the Lizard for ages now, and the last time it had been at the end of a long cycle ride with her friends, but she wasn't thinking about them today, not even a certain one of them. They reached Helston and turned left to begin the drive down the Lizard Peninsula. Some crazy names you have around here, Gary commented. I dare say you'll think we have some crazy customs too, Amber said. If you'd been here a few weeks ago, you could have seen the Helston furry day. It's not quite as colourful as it used to be in the old days when folk used to dance through the streets and in and out of one another's houses. They wore garlands of flowers and were led through the town by fiddlers. It still carried on, to a lesser degree, though. That sure is some weird custom, Gary said with a laugh. Although, I guess, some places in the Midwest of America have some quaint old customs, too. Don't ask me about them, though. Like I said, I'm a New Yorker. What's it like? You said you'd tell me. Well, it's nothing like this, Gary said, as they began to travel down the lizard, and the vast green areas opened out in front of them, thick with gorse and wild flowers, and with an almost overpoweringly sweet fragrance. New York is all concrete and skyscrapers, except for the relief of Central Park, but it's not natural way this place is. It is beautiful, isn't it? Amber said, seeing it through his eyes now. If you like natural things, then you ought to see Kynance Cove. But when we get there, we'll have to leave the jeep and walk down. There's no other way down to it, unfortunately. That's okay, honey. I'm just enjoying the afternoon out, and I hope you are too. She was. She felt happier than she had in a long while, and it was easy to forget the W word completely now. This place was untouched by any bad memories, and she was eager to show Gary the places she knew and loved. She didn't love him. That kind of feeling didn't come into it, and wasn't likely to. 
She was just happy to be alive and out in the country in familiar surroundings. They drove as far as they could to the area above Kainan's Cove. The granite cliffs were awesome here, but there were grassy slopes where it was possible to slither, laughing, hand in hand, down towards the cove. The sea crashed magnificently against the rocks, the white foam contrasting vividly with the blue of the sea and sky. Offshore was Asparagus Island and Gull Rock, both circled with spume now. At low tide, you can walk over to Asparagus Island, Amber said as they paused for breath once they had reached the sandy inlet. There are caves here too. They've all got funny names, like the kitchen, the parlour, the drawing room and the devil's mouth. Then there's the bishop's rock and the devil's letter box and bellows, where the water is forced up through the hole with a lion's roar. It scared me to death when I first heard it. You have to go inside the drawing room and take a look at the colours in the rocks too. It's supposed to be lucky to touch as many colours as you can. And am I talking too much? She knew she was. All of a sudden she was nervous. She was here alone with a handsome man who must be at least a few years older than herself and they had seen no other walkers about on this fine afternoon. She began to wonder if she had been headstrong and foolish in suggesting Kainan's Cove because what did she really know about Gary after all? Before he answered he sat down on a rock and proceeded to take off his shoes and socks and she looked at him in even more alarm. What are you doing? She stuttered. I'm going to dip my toes in the ocean, he said. It's too tempting to resist, and I bet you're itching to do the same. Amber began to laugh. Not lightly. Do you know how cold it's going to be? Well, I'm not suggesting dunking my entire body. Just my toes. So watch. He rolled up his trouser legs, raced down to the edge of the sand, and walked right in, then turned with a yelp and ran back out again, hopping about from one leg to the other until he got more used to the cold. Then he trekked along the edge of the waves more leisurely. It's great! Come on in! Amber didn't resist any longer. She slipped out of her sandals and ran down the cove to join him, taking the hand he offered until her toes touched the freezing water and sent a shiver up through her whole body. It was still early summer, and the sun hadn't warmed up the sea sufficiently to enjoy it yet. We must be mad, she gasped, as they waded along the water's edge together. I used to do this with my friends, but not this early in the summer. They didn't stay in the sea for very long. Gary produced a clean, folded handkerchief and handed it to Amber to dry her feet while he rubbed his own dry in the sand and pulled on his socks and shoes. My girl and I used to do it too, so I guess that's what I was thinking about. But enough is enough. Let's dry these feet and get back up top and do a bit more exploring. I want to see more of this lizard. Your girl? Amber said, as usual, picking out the relevant piece of information from any conversation and ignoring the rest.
Side 10 When they reached the top of the cliffs again, they flopped down on the grass to get their breath back, and Gary pulled out a wallet from his jacket pocket. I'll show you her picture, he said. Her name's Greta. Like Greta Garbo, Amber said, unable to think of anything else, as she looked at the very glamorous blonde girl smiling up out of the photograph. Gary laughed. Hardly, although my Greta also comes from an old Swedish family. They came to the States a hundred years ago and settled there and made good. Greta's an actress, too. One day she hopes to play on Broadway, but you have to do more than just live in New York to make the boards there. Show business is a tough old world, especially when girls with any looks at all think they could make it as movie stars. This was all going slightly over Amber's head now, having had so little to do with show business herself, and she didn't think that mentioning either her old school or the local amateur dramatic group would impress Gary too much. He gazed at the photo for a minute longer, ran his thumb softly over the image, and then put it back in his wallet. He was a long way from home and missing his girl, and having her photograph at least brought her that little bit nearer. Amber wondered immediately if Luke would ever have thought of doing anything like that, even if he had any photographs of her, which he didn't. She heard Gary clear his throat and realised she had probably been silent for too long. She jumped up and held out her hand, deliberately cheerful. Well, come on. You wanted to see some more of the lizard, didn't you? If you're feeling more adventurous at some other time, you could drive right down to Land's End and wave to America. She hoped he didn't think she was angling for another invitation, but he laughed, catching her hand and her mood as he stood up. That would be something, wouldn't it? And you've never told me anything about your own special someone. A pretty girl like you has got to have one. Is he away in the forces too? A pretty girl like her. Amber smiled inside at that, and then realised he wanted her to say she had a special someone. Maybe he thought she'd imagined she was falling for him, which was why he'd mentioned his Greta. He needn't worry, though, because she wasn't falling for him. It was just nice to have a friend. It was flattering, too. It made her feel good. It was almost a status symbol to have a yank these days, she thought fleetingly, and it was such a shallow thought that she was instantly ashamed of it. But she had her pride, too, so of course she was going to mention her someone special. He was special to her, even if she wasn't to him. His name's Luke she said, as they clambered back into the jeep. We've known each other forever, and now he's in the Navy and I haven't heard from him for ages. Her face suddenly crumpled and her eyes filled with tears. She hadn't expected this, and she didn't want it. She didn't want to blubber in front of this lovely, considerate Yank who was handing her his handkerchief again. It was gritty and full of sand now, but after a few minutes, she blew into it hard. While she was still wondering whether or not to hand it back to him, he told her to keep it, and then he leaned across and kissed her flushed cheek. You're a nice kid, Amber, and this Luke must be crazy not to keep in touch. But don't blame him too much for that, honey. It's a miracle that any correspondence gets anywhere in this war. You may not hear from him for weeks, and then... You'll get a bundle of letters together. You'll see. Perhaps you're right, she said, her eyes still watery, knowing damn well that this wasn't the case. She was grateful that at least he hadn't suggested anything more sinister in the fact that she hadn't heard from Luke in ages, like his ship being torpedoed or being captured by the enemy. But she would have known if anything like that had happened because his mother would have had one of those dreaded telegrams and she would surely have told her. Both lost in thoughts of their own, Gary drove the jeep down the length of the Lizard Peninsula until they reached Lizard Point, where the ocean crashed onto the rocks and the wind almost took their voices away. Out in the sea stood the sentinel of wolf light. 
the lighthouse that was the model for so many multicoloured souvenirs made from Cornish serpentine stone and sold in local shops in Lizard Town nearby and everywhere else in Cornwall. They say the light is only visible for about 21 miles because of the curvature of the earth, Amber told Gary. It's one of the few things I remember from local history lessons at school because when I was a kid I used to think the lighthouse might fall off. It doesn't prevent the shipwrecks happening though. We've always had our share around the Cornish coasts and a lot of piracy and smuggling in the old days too. She wished she hadn't mentioned shipwrecks and she gave a small shiver as they left the jeep and walked along the edge of the cliffs. You're cold, he said at once. I think we should go and find one of those little cafes in the town and have something hot to drink. I might buy one of these cute little lighthouse models you're talking about for Greta, too. She likes collecting things, and I know she's never seen anything like that. She sounds very nice, Amber said, for want of something to say. She is. We were thinking of getting engaged just before I was sent overseas. Overseas? Oh, you mean here? That's right. But it seemed foolish to rush into something when I was likely to be away for the good Lord knows how long. I know she'll wait for me, though. Just like I guess your boy knows you'll wait for him. Although I guess you're still a bit young to be thinking of anything permanent. I'm sixteen, she said indignantly. And I'm twenty. I never did four years make such a difference. She didn't care too much for this conversation, since he evidently considered her little more than a child. It was so obvious that he was missing his Greta, and wishing even more that he was anywhere but here. Well, she didn't much want to be here either, not with him, and she was missing somebody too. Gee, honey, I didn't mean to sound so gloomy. We were in danger of getting around to the W word, he was saying now. Let's go and get that hot tea, and maybe a scone or two to go with it if we're lucky, and we'll just make the most of this lovely day and not think about anything else. Is it a deal? It's a deal, Amber said solemnly. Late that afternoon, Granny Penn had the table laid with fish paste sandwiches beneath a lace doily to keep them fresh, together with fresh baked carrot and turnip cake and clearly expected Gary to eat with them before he went back to camp. This is very good of you, he said, although I didn't expect it, and you shouldn't have gone to so much trouble, ma'am. When the day comes that a Cornish woman can't offer hospitality to a stranger, that's the day I shall hang up my boots, she said spikily. The Jerrys have taken plenty from us these past few years, but they haven't broken our spirit yet, and they never will. So, sit yourself down, young man, and don't tell me you Americans haven't got good appetites, because I'm sure you're no different from the rest of us in that respect. He grinned. You sure do remind me of my grandmother, ma'am, and I say that as a great compliment. She's a game old gal, too. Amber giggled, not sure how her gran was going to react to such a remark, and then she saw Granny Penn go a bit pink, an answer with a sniff. Well, take that as being a good thing, then. Now, let's eat, because I can't bear to think all this is going to waste. There are starving children in Africa who'd be glad of such a feast. Amber groaned, wondering if Gary would think this was a twee thing to say. But he winked and said that his grandmother had always told him about the starving children in China to make him eat up his greens. They weren't so different then. She was undecided about how much to tell Dolly about their date. On the one hand, it would raise her prestige no end if she said she had had a romantic afternoon in the country with Gary and that he'd kissed her. Well, so he had, but only on the cheek. It was hardly what you'd call a romantic kiss, but since she hadn't wanted one, it didn't matter. It wasn't the kind of thing you told a friend like Dolly, though. Dolly would expect chapter and verse on how torrid the afternoon had been and how she had had to beat him off to save her honour. 
and Dolly would have been pea green with envy to hear about it. In the end, she exaggerated a bit, but not too much. If she made it sound as if she had forgotten all about Luke, maybe that was all to the good. Although, reading her letter back, it did seem as if it was all Gary, 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 and it made her feel a bit uneasy, as if she was writing a story instead of reporting the things that had really happened. She certainly didn't mention blonde Greta, who looked as if she already belonged in a Hollywood picture. Why would Gary ever look at any other girl when he had her to go home to? Amber gritted her teeth and finished her letter with a flourish, saying she wasn't sure when she'd be seeing him again because the Yanks seemed to come and go so often on what Gary mysteriously called their missions, so she'd just have to be patient and pine. When she read the letter back again, it seemed so silly and melodramatic that she was tempted to screw it up and begin again. But then she imagined Dolly's eyes getting wider and wider as she read it. So she quickly stuffed it in an envelope, ready for posting. Let Dolly think she was having a whale of a time in her war, Amber thought grimly. Six weeks later, when summer was at its height and the Yanks in Gary's unit had temporarily gone out of town, there were two letters from Luke on the same day. It was just as Gary had said. You never knew where letters got to these days. There would be nothing but a deafening silence for weeks, and then they would all come in a bundle. Not that two letters were exactly a bundle, but they were something to make Amber's heart thump with excitement, something to cherish and to take upstairs to her bedroom to read in private, even though they weren't exactly love letters. We thought we bought it the other night, he wrote, in the kind of shorthand language they all use now. In fact, a couple of our sparks, that's electricians to you, were quite badly wounded when we got hit, but it was only a glancing blow to the ship, and luckily we were near enough to a port to put in for repairs. Naturally, I can't tell you where, Amber, but they don't speak English. And how frustrating was that, Amber thought, fuming. She would love to have followed his progress on a map, but she knew he wasn't allowed to give away his position these days, presumably in case she was going to rush off and tell it to some enemy spy. She wondered where this port could be. It had to be somewhere friendly, and there weren't that many places open to them in the world now. It was a frightening thought. Maybe it was Norway, and maybe it wasn't. She carried on reading, and her heart gave a jolt at the next bit. You'll be glad to know I always carry my lucky piece of amber with me. It's my talisman. I rely on it to keep me safe, and I don't fancy being fish bait just yet. Her face softened, her eyes glistening, her fingers running gently over the paper, as if she could trace the movements of his fingers holding the pencil as he wrote the words. As if she could breathe his breath as he leaned over the letter in the dimness of the night to write to her. How could she forget, even for a moment, how much she loved him and wanted him back? If she had to wait years for him, he was the only one she had ever wanted, and she wanted him still. She realised, too, that he always mentioned the piece of amber she had given him, as if to remind her that he still carried a little piece of her with him wherever he went. The second letter was very short. It merely said that they were off on some special course of action, and if she didn't hear from him for a while, she wasn't to worry. Like a bad penny, he'd turn up when she was least expecting him. It didn't thrill her to read this letter. It seemed to be guarded, as if he was afraid to say too much at all. And in any case, whatever this special course of action was, it was probably over and done with by now, or they were still in the middle of it. She always scanned the newspaper for any news of it, but compared with the big naval battles of the war, such as the strikes on the German battleships, there was never any mention of it. It was as if it had vanished as surely as the Marie Celeste. She knew that wasn't true, of course, because she had the evidence of it here, in her hands, in the two precious letters he had sent her. She put them with all the rest in her memory box, and sent up a silent prayer 
that this war would be over soon and that they could all get back to living normal lives. But for now, she had the consolation that Luke still thought of her. She was still his girl, no matter how many times he professed that this wasn't the right time for young girls to get serious. Besides, she hadn't inherited her grandmother's fainness for nothing. He could pretend all he liked, but when fate had decreed that two people were meant to be together, it was unstoppable. It was a thought to lift her heart, no matter how long the parting. Even Gary Emerson knew that. He may not have a Cornish man's sense of knowing such things, but he knew it in his heart that his Greta would wait for him, just as Amber would always wait for Luke. Dolly was agog at reading Amber's latest letter. Well, blow me down with a feather, she remarked to Jude, the girl on the market stall alongside hers. Who says these girls at the back of beyond are slow at coming forward? Is that the one you was evacuated with? said Jude. I thought she had a boy down there that you was quite sweet on as well. Dolly tossed her blonde curls. We was always going to be rivals, me and Amber and I wasn't seriously interested in Luke, even though he was the best of a bad job among the kids in Falmouth at the time. I always thought I'd a bit more gumption than her, though. I didn't see why he should fancy her over me. Jude gave a shrieking laugh. You was never a shy one, was you, girl? Dolly shrugged. If you've got it, flaunt it, my mum always says. But now this little shrinking violet's gone and got herself a yank. So, I reckon Lukey boy's well out of the picture. If I ever go back down to the sticks, I might have another go at him myself. But you ain't thinking of it, are ya? What about John Joe? Ain't he planning to take you to America and make you a movie star? Dolly flushed darkly. I found out he's bleeding well married, and I ain't wasting my time on him no more. I'm not saying I'd ever go back to Cornwall again, but I might go one day just to take a look around, especially now that my mum's talking about getting hitched to Uncle Joe. I used to get fed up with their lovey dovying but they're squabbling half the time now, so they might as well be bleeding well married. She scowled. It had been fun when she was a kid to have all these uncles coming around. Uncle Joe, in particular, had always brought her things when he'd been courting her mum. But now they were thinking of making it legal, there weren't so many little extras coming her way anymore. She didn't think of herself as being particularly mercenary, but when you had been used to it for so long, you missed it when it wasn't there anymore. It wouldn't be such a bad idea to get away for a while, particularly if Lukey Boy came home again. She found it easy to overlook the fact that Luke had always been Amber's boy. If she no longer wanted him, that left the way open for Dolly. And in any case, she wasn't likely ever to let such a small consideration get in her way, she thought with a grin. All was fair in love and war. Towards the end of 1943, more and more US troops poured into Falmouth and other Cornish coastal towns as their advanced amphibious training bases were established at St. Moore's, Falmouth and Foy. It was obvious to everyone now that a big invasion was being planned to take place along the northern French coast to push the Germans back. Nobody had any idea when it was going to happen, and it couldn't take place until everyone was certain of what they had to do and had the means and equipment to do it. But excitement in the area was rife, not least because there were so many more servicemen in the area now, and Jenny at the Forces Club said that any girl who didn't have a G.I. boyfriend wasn't doing her bit for the war effort. If that isn't just like you, Amber said, exasperated. It's a pity Dolly's not here to listen to such tripe, because she'd be sure to go along with it. And you're not? Since when did you become too high and mighty to go out with a yank? The minute your friend Gary shows up here, you're not slow on the uptake, are you, kid? Though I notice he ain't been around for a while. He's on manoeuvres, Amber said mechanically. It was the usual reply when you didn't have a clue where anybody was these days. 
The only certainty about this war was the sense of uncertainty. One thing was certain, though. Meeting Luke's parents at church recently, she had learned that there was no chance of him getting home for Christmas. Mrs. Gillam was resigned to it now, but she couldn't disguise the anxiety in her eyes as she spoke of her son, nor when she mentioned that that nice young Eddie Fielding had been killed in France. Amber felt completely shocked. Eddie Fielding, she echoed, instantly picturing the thin, spotty youth who had been in the class above them at school and who Dolly had amazingly been smitten with at one time. What was he doing in France? I thought he was working at the docks, and he surely wasn't old enough to join up. None of them are old enough to be shot and killed, Luke's mother said acidly. But like so many young boys, they get carried away by the excitement of being soldiers. And this is the result. It's the mothers I feel sorry for. And the wives, and sisters, and girlfriends. Amber murmured without thinking and was shocked again to receive a freezing look from Luke's mother. It seems to me too many young girls find it easy enough to forget that their boyfriends are away fighting for them, she said. Amber's temper flared at once. Thankfully, Granny Penn was talking to some other friends and couldn't hear how she snapped at Luke's mother. Well, if that's supposed to be a dig at me, Mrs Gillum, Perhaps I should remind you how you insisted that I was far too young to have any romantic ideas about Luke. It's hardly my fault that the war has gone on so long and that I've grown up in the meantime, is it? Anyway, I don't think it's going to be much consolation to Eddie Fielding's mother whether he had a girlfriend or not. She was more upset than she let on. It was horrible to think that school friends were being killed in this war. It was something you never even thought about. War was for proper soldiers and sailors and airmen, not for school kids. She smothered a sob in her throat as she marched across to where Granny Penn was turning to look at her now. Can we go home? She said in a choked voice. What's happened? It's Eddie Fielding from school. He's been killed in France. You don't mean the young chap that Dolly went out with a few times? That's the one. And now she would have to tell Dolly next time she wrote. It would be a bit different from reporting how many more Yanks were coming into town and who was going out with who. Suddenly it all seemed so shallow and she wheeled around and ran back to where Luke's parents were still chatting. Mrs Gillum. I'm so sorry for talking to you the way I did just now. It was the shock of hearing about Eddie, that's all. Luke's mother had always been a kind and forgiving woman, and she kissed Amber on the cheek at once. My dear, we all say things we don't mean at such times, and your apology proves to me that you're growing up very fast, and not in such a bad way either. If growing up fast meant the acceptance of losing more and more old friends, then she wasn't sure she wanted to know about it, Amber thought numbly as she rejoined her gran. Is there any news about Luke? Granny Penn asked quietly, tucking her hand firmly through Amber's arm. No, she said. And before you tell me no news is good news, I always did think that was a pointless thing to say. No news is no news. I wasn't going to say it. I prefer to think that when there's no news, there's always hope. You're not going to argue about that, I trust, seeing as how you're in your usual argumentative mood today. Amber felt her face relax a little. It wasn't fair to take out her frustration on her gran. They all had to face up to whatever fate and war threw at them, and more than one of Granny Penn's friends had lost a son or a nephew. War touched all of them in some way. It was just harder to accept it when you were not yet 17 and worrying about what might be happening to someone special. I'm going to be all sweetness and light from now on, she promised, which made Granny Penn burst out laughing. And pigs might fly too, she said, but she squeezed Amber's arm to her with real affection. 
If she had expected some dramatic reaction from Dolly when she reported the news about Eddie Fielding, she was disappointed. Dolly merely wrote him off in a single sentence, saying she always knew Eddie was too much of a dumbbell to keep his head down. She could be really nasty sometimes, thought Amber, because Eddie had been genuinely fond of her, and he deserved more than a brush-off. But towards the end of November, she had more important things to think about than Dolly's fickleness. There was a rap on the cottage door one evening, and she opened it to find Luke standing there. Her heart thudded so fast, she thought she was going to keel over, and then the glory of the moment was so intense that it didn't matter what he was expecting, or whether or not Granny Penn was hovering behind her. All she could do was to croak his name before the breath went out of her, and then she threw herself into his arms. Well, this is a welcome and a half, he said with a smile in his voice. Are you going to let me in, or are we going to show the whole town that you're pleased to see me? Since there were so few other cottages around this part of town, it was unlikely, but she knew at once that he was pleased with her reaction. She knew him too well to be unaware of it. She knew him as if he was the other half of her. She drew him inside, still caught in his arms, moving as one person, until they reluctantly broke apart as he greeted Granny Penn. Come and sit you down, Luke, and I'll get us all a drink before Amber strangles you. Amber grinned sheepishly at Luke, knowing this was to give them a few minutes alone. A few minutes, when in reality she wanted an hour, a whole night, an entire lifetime. She felt her face flush knowing the way her thoughts were going now. But she was no longer a child, and her feelings towards Luke were far from the childish ones of their school days. She wanted him with a woman's need. She wanted to look at him and hold him and never let him go again. As if something of her own intensity was transmitting to him, his gaze wandered over her, as if he had never seen her before. They were sitting several feet apart now, yet the distance between them was as nothing. She shivered, knowing his feelings were changing as swiftly as hers had done. She could sense it as surely as she breathed. I thought we could go for a drive up to Pendennis Hill, he said, moments before Granny Penn came in with a tray of hot drinks. I've got my dad's car outside and a bit of petrol to spare, and I've got a yen to see our old haunts again while I've got the chance. This is a special leave, Amber, since I won't be home for Christmas, so I want to make the most of it. What do you say? She knew he was asking for more than a drive to visit their old haunts. She knew it and accepted it and agreed to it, lovingly and joyously. As soon as they decently could, they left the cottage and Amber slid into the car seat beside Luke. The night wasn't cold, but she was shivering inside with a different kind of shivering now, knowing that whatever happened tonight was going to change her forever. She knew what making love meant, but all those stumbling words from the teachers at school, all the snide sniggering from some of the older girls at the club, all the times that Dolly had pretended to be so sophisticated and to know all about it, it all meant nothing compared with her churning excitement they were necessarily close together in the small car, their legs touching, their breath warming the interior and steaming up the windows. And they didn't speak as the car took them up the steep, rounded climb to the top of the hill. It was fitting that it would be here that they finally professed their love and made it real. Luke stopped the car on a grassy patch at the top, and when he turned off the engine, the silence was like a living, breathing thing. Above them, the grey sentinel of Pendennis Castle seemed like a benevolent sleeping giant. Far below, the sea glittered in the pale moonlight, where dozens of ships of all shapes and sizes, grey and menacing, and yet oddly protective of the harbour, formed a magnificent backdrop, as still and silent now as a film setting. It was as if the whole world was waiting tonight. There were no air raids, no enemy planes, no burning buildings, 
just a breathtaking silence punctuated only by their heartbeats. Beautiful, isn't it? Luke said at last, and she knew that for one moment more he was seeing the flotilla below through a seaman's eyes and not as a lover. Then he turned to her, but not as beautiful as you. I've been waiting so long for you to grow up, Amber. And then I went away and I almost missed it. She didn't know how to answer that, but there was no need because he was pulling her into his arms and his kisses were urgent and passionate and everything she had ever wanted. He was so dear and familiar, part of her life, and yet, at the same time, he was a thrilling stranger she had never known before, not like this. God, how I want to make love to you, Amber, he was saying huskily, his mouth against hers. You'll never know how much I'm fighting against it. Why are you fighting against it, then? She whispered. Don't you think I want it, too? Don't you think I've wanted it all my life? She didn't know where the words came from, or if it was proper to say them. She reveled in the fact that he wanted her, needed her, and loved her. Nothing and nobody else mattered. Are you saying that you wouldn't think too badly of me? She answered by taking his hand and pressing it to her breast. If he was the older one, then she was the wiser one when it came to these special moments that were going to deepen their relationship forever. I would think badly of you if you didn't make me feel that you loved me as much as I love you, she said. We're not children anymore, Luke. The way I feel about you has nothing to do with childish feelings. You must know that. She held her breath as his hand moved over her breast. She hardly knew that the buttons on her blouse had somehow become undone until his hand had slipped inside it and she felt the warmth of it against her flesh. She gave a soft sigh of pleasure and yearned against him in the confines of the small car. This is ridiculous, she heard him say roughly. It's not the place for us to make love for the first time either. There's a blanket in the car and the caves will shelter us. Will you come with me? For one second, she was tempted to give him one of her throwaway answers, one of the silly, teasing retorts they had so often thrown at one another. But this was not the time or place for that either. It would take an earthquake to stop me, she said softly. They left the car and ran along the grass to where the slope was more gentle, down to the small caves they knew of old. Amber's heart raced erratically, but she knew that moments from now Luke would be irrevocably hers, and she would have gone to the ends of the earth for this night. They slithered down the grass until the opening of the first cave was alongside them. It was dark inside, smelling faintly of dampness and seaweed, where the rough seas threw up the spume and sometimes even filled the lower part of the cave. But not tonight. Tonight, the sea was calm, rippling gently far below them, and Luke spread the blanket on the sandy floor of the cave and drew her down beside him. My lovely girl, he said huskily, stroking her tangled hair. My lovely, patient, grown-up girl. Do you see what you do to me? He took her hand, pulling it gently down over his body, where she could feel the hardness of him. She swallowed, frightened for a moment at the sheer power in a man's body, and, as if he understood, he quickly removed her hand and pressed it to his lips. There's no need to be afraid, Amber. I would never hurt you. I only want to prove to you how much I adore you. For a brief moment, she felt a strange sense of anger. Perversely, in this intensely pleasurable moment, she wanted to shriek at him that if he adored her so much, why had he left her alone for so long? Why leave her not knowing if he was alive or dead? Why never write the letters she longed to have from him? The moment passed as quickly as it came. There would be time for explanations later, if there were any to be made. 
and if she wanted to hear them. Right now, as his hands began to explore her body in a way that was completely new to her, she wasn't sure she wanted to hear them at all. He was touching her as she had never been touched before, kissing her in places she had never been kissed before, and she was responding in a way she had never known before. Oh, Luke, my Luke, she breathed, hardly able to bear the exquisiteness of the sensations he was arousing in her. Then, at last, she felt his body heavy on hers, and the small pain as he entered her for the first time brought only the faintest of cries from deep in her throat. And then she was rising with him, riding with him, and glorying in being one with him. A long while later, wrapped together for warmth and comfort in the blanket now, they rose reluctantly from the floor of the cave. He had murmured so many incoherent words to her in the moments after their joining, and she had whispered them back, wild, emotional words of love and forever, and other words from Luke about things he had seen and done which were indelibly part of the nightmare of being at sea, at war, a man's war. They were ugly words that she didn't want to hear, but which seemed to be torn out of him in a kind of release as important to him as that other release that had bonded them together forever. I've only got three days leave, he said abruptly, when they were finally back in the car again, and still reluctant to leave this place. I didn't want to tell you before, but everything is so uncertain nowadays, and I think of us as the one constant thing in this world. I needed to be sure that you feel the same, sweetheart. But I think I know it now. Sometimes Amber thought with a flash of her usual spirit, men could be the blindest people on earth. How could he not have known, for all these years, the way she felt about him? But then his words registered properly. Only three days, she echoed. It's not enough time, Luke. It's never enough time, but it's all I've got, so we must make the most of it, sweetheart. And I promise I'll try to write to you more often in future. It doesn't matter. Well, it does. But as long as I know you're safe, I won't worry too much. Of course I'll be safe. I've got my piece of amber. And I've got my real amber now, haven't I? You always did, she thought.